I read in the paper today, in the paper today, in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, today, uh, a man was in, in line in a convenience store, and it's a rude man that with a nasty attitude came and cut in front of him, just got in front of him. And, you know, he wasn't in a hurry, so he just backed up and let the guy just, just cut the line and just get in front of him. And he just waited till his turn, and, and so he was totally kind. And remember, the Bible says, don't repay evil for evil. I mean, he, he, he said something, wanted to do something, but he, he, just, he just let the guy just have his way. God was rude, God was nasty, and he let him be served. And so, in his kindness to let this man go, then he gets the one standing who was courteous, he gets there, and it's his turn at the counter, he buys a lottery ticket <laughs> and wins a million dollars. He won a million dollars, just like that. Just randomly let the machine, you know, pick it. And maybe have the guy in front of him not come there and gotten a ticket. Maybe that guy would have gotten his ticket, you know, had he not let that guy go first. You, you see, the Bible, the scriptures had already said, if you do it, God will bless you for it. There is a blessing in it. I mean, he's not trying to punish you. God's not trying to punish you. I, did you know God loves you? So he's not trying to punish you. He's trying to bless you. If you replay evil for evil, now he's got to deal with you for the evil that you dealt out. <laughs> so, if you want the blessing, and I just wanted to show you how, how real that is. I just read that in the paper today. Wow. That, that sort of confirms this. It says, that is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. Now, here's the other. So, make sure that you write that down. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You notice that? No, no let's read it again. Don't repay <laughs> evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Now, you got to get that in your spirit. You got to go over and over with that because it's not natural. That is, that's supernatural. That's not natural. That is supernatural. Notice, instead, pay them back with a blessing. And that is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. Now, here's the next passage. I want you to write this down. And if you have a really challenge with this, meditate on it, memorize it. Luke chapter 6, verse 31 through 36 in the Message Bible. Notice how it reads. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want, for peop what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If only, I mean, if you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give what you hoped to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. And then notice 35 and 36. I tell you, this is Jesus talking, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us generously and graciously. Even when we're at our worst, our Father is kind, you be kind. Now, meditate on that. Write that scripture out. You know, particularly if you have a hard time doing that by your own nature, write that scripture out, meditate on it, listen to it over and over again. So, how do you deal with rudeness when you encounter it? How do you deal with rudeness when you encounter it? Rude behavior is irritating and it is unattractive. So how do you deal with rudeness when you encounter it? I mean, it's very, very tempting to retaliate with equally offensive behavior the way that others are doing toward us, but then you compromise your own sense of dignity. Let me give you a few things that help us. I would say number one, take the high road. Take the high road. Smile at the offender. Smile at them. And keep your voice very calm and level. Very calm and level. Most people will unconsciously alter their tone to match yours. So if somebody else is screaming and the veins are popping out of the side of their neck, 
the last thing that you want to do is to get in a screaming, a shouting match with them. Bring your voice down. Sir, this is, I don't make the company policies here. <laughs> Just bring your voice down. Be very calm. Be very calm. Because if you meet screaming with screaming, the situation is sure to escalate. If you meet screaming with screaming. But uh, if you meet rudeness with calmness, you will take control of the situation and you will steer the interaction towards a kinder, more reasonable uh, kind of an atmosphere. Now let me say this to you, as, as, as I'm saying, take the high road, take the high road, uh, fake calmness if necessary. I mean, even if you want to scream to the top of your, fake it if necessary. If you have to, if you have to fake it, even if it's not coming from a genuine place, just, just fake, fake it. Because your results will be better at the end of the day. It will be better. Trust me, it will be better if you just calm down, just talk in a low, firm level of voice, but don't get into the shouting match. Because once you are calm and steady in your tone, anyone who continues uh, to, to, yell at you and bring rudeness your way and throw shade your way? Anybody who does that will start to feel small and silly and out of control because they will see that you're not going to participate in that. I'm not going to stoop to your level. I'm not going to stoop to your, to, to your level. So take the high road. Here's the second thing. Redirect your anger. Redirect your anger. I've seen some people that have such anger issues, they get angry at inanimate objects. I mean, they will get angry at an inanimate object. I've seen, uh, you know, uh, people attacking a Coke machine <laughs> because their drink didn't come out. Attacking a snack machine because the cookies are hung up in there and the <laughs> potato chips. I mean, I nearly turned one over myself. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't. The devil is alive. <laughs> I, I had it on. I had it up in the air, you know. <laughs> that is, uh, there's a term for that. It's called percussive maintenance. I mean, I beat one machine until my cookies fell down. <laughs> Redirect your anger. Redirect your anger. It is not healthy to hold anger in. It is not healthy to hold anger in. It's not healthy to push anger down. It's not healthy to pretend that anger does not exist. You have to redirect anger. Redirect anger. Rather than repressing this negative energy, redirect that anger by putting it to good use. You have to redirect anger. Let me give you some ideas for how you redirect anger. The first thing I would say, write about it. Write about it. Journaling can help you to, to redirect your anger. You get angry, go home and journal. Write about it. If you're angry over some treatment in a store, go back, write the manager, write the owner of the store. Put it in writing, write about it. It can help you to redirect your anger. Redirect anger. You, you're, you're channeling it. So write about it. Write about it. Write about it. Journal about it. And it can actually be quite therapeutic because the, here, here's the principle, on the paper, out of the mind. And you don't want to carry so much anger home with you that you can't even sleep. So you want to write about it. Here's the second thing, paint about it. If you're artistic and you have the ability to be able to paint, paint that thing out. Paint how you feel. Paint it. Paint it. You'd be surprised how therapeutic just painting, if that's your gift. Here's a third way. Sing about it. Sing about it. Singing exercises your heart, your lungs, and it, it releases endorphins in your body that actually make you feel good. So sing. I mean, you know, not any time a spouse and getting on your nerves just gets bust out into a hum. You got, I mean, just, you, 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 have, to, you have to carry a song with you. You know, I mean, you will be surprised. It is a survival technique. It is a, you have to carry, you know, just, just carry a song in you. Just sing about it. Here's another one. Uh, work it out physically. 
work it out physically. Uh, use that anger as a fuel to run, to go jogging, uh, to go work out at the gym, uh, to, to do boxing, or whatever it is that you do. Use it to, to, to do something physical. Ch re redirect that anger. Redirect that anger. Here's another idea. Make something. Make something. You know, there was a story of a man and a woman. They had been married for more than 60 years. More than 60 years. They had shared everything together. And they talked about everything. They kept no secrets from each other except that the little old lady, now they've been married over 60 years, and this little old lady kept a shoebox on the top shelf in her closet. And she cautioned her husband, don't ever open this and don't even ask me about it. That's mine. It's no business of yours. And all of those years, this husband had never, ever thought about the box. Until after, you know, when you've been married over 60 years, you know, your number could come up at any moment. <laughs> the young man may die. The old man must die. And all of these years, and he had never thought about the box, but one day the old lady got sick. And the doctor said she wouldn't recover. And so, trying to sort out their affairs, the old man went and got the shoebox and he took it to his wife's bedside and she agreed that it was time that she told him about what was in the box. And when, when he opened the shoebox, he found in it two crocheted dolls and a stack of money totaling $95,000. And he asked her about the, the, uh, the contents. And the woman told him, she said, when we were about to be married, she said, my grandmother told me that the secret to a happy marriage is never to argue. And she's told me that if I ever got angry, that I should just keep quiet and crochet a doll. And he was, the old man, tears welled up in his eyes. He saw those two dolls. He says, in all of these years, over 60 years of marriage, and she's only been angry at me twice. <laughs> and he almost lost it, just so emotional. And he says, honey, that explains the dolls. He says, but where did all of this money come from? And she said, that's the money that I made from selling the dolls. And you do understand that the moral of the story is that you got to channel your anger into something that is productive. You really do. You, you really do. You really do. So redirect your anger. Here's a third thing. Maintain perspective. Maintain perspective. And let me tell you why. Because the right perspective will eventually put you in the right position. And the right position will eventually bring to you the right provisions. The right perspective will eventually put you in the right position. And the right position will provide for you the right provisions. But ultimately, the rude things that people say and do they tell more about them than they do you. So see their un unkind action for what it is. It's really a reflection of their inner self and the inner world that they inhabit. And realize that it really has nothing to do with you. They're only showing you who they are. They're not showing you who you are. So when people are out of control and their anger is raging, I mean, I've seen people do that. I've seen people nasty with people in restaurants, nasty at the airport, nasty in, in, in retail stores, just nasty because they, they came in with an issue. 
with chips on their shoulder and they were taking it off on a person who may not have had anything directly to do with it and they're taking the whole anger against everybody in the organization or whoever did this, the malfunction of that, they are taking it out on this person who may not, may not have had anything to do with it. So if a person's reaction is bigger than the action that you did to them, it's always about something that happened before they met you. It really is. It is. So just realize you have to maintain perspective. This is not about me. They're showing me who they are. Here's number four. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. You notice the scripture in, in verse 14 said, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. You have to bless people. Uh, to, to bless means actually to speak spoken words or to do acts that are conducive to a person's happiness or their welfare. You can bless people with your words. You can bless them with wisdom. You can bless them with counsel. You can bless people with words of praise out of your mouth. You can bless people with words of thanksgiving. See, um, there, there are different ways that you can bless people. You'd be surprised how if you bless people, how, how they can change. And sometimes it's just that nobody has ever taken the time to say thank you to people. They've, they've been slaving, they've been working diligently, and other people complain to them. But you'd be surprised how you can just bless people and it can change their attitude. Compliment them on something genuinely from your heart. Bless them. Find a way to bless them through acts of love, giving money, helping a person to clean up. Uh, helping a person to wash clothes, to care for a sick person, to babysit somebody else's children. You'd be surprised. These things communicate and demonstrate love in an incredible way. But let your blessing that you give to people be very specific so that you will recognize it when it arrives. Now, I didn't realize this because, you know, sometimes I'd grown up, I'd just hear, hear people, you know, I'd grow up, I'd hear my pastor say, you know, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. <laughs> it just said just God bless you, you know. And, and I never realized until I was in Africa. And somebody grabbed me and they said, no, no. No, bless me specifically. Don't just say, bless me, God bless you. God bless me with what? And he taught me in the pronouncing of the blessing to speak the blessing with specificity. That you bless them, for example, if they need wisdom to be able to make a decision, if they need peace to be able to sleep well at night, if they need the favor of God to come so that doors are open, if they need God's peace to overshadow their household where arguments have been breaking out and they don't understand that they are under a spirit of attack. They need deliverance from some demonic thing that God may you break them free from the hand of the enemy and knock out the, the teeth of the enemy that's trying to attack their life. May, as, as a blessing of God is, can be pronounced, it needs to be pr pronounced with specificity so that you recognize it when it comes. You'd be surprised how many people are mean-spirited just because they are destitute of a blessing. They've never been blessed. And so we have to use our mouths to bless people, to bless people into who they should be. Bless them in, 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 in giving this thing specifically into their life of what God wants to do. Blessing them with the wisdom to be able to make good decisions because perhaps they've been in a habit of making impulsive decisions and then their life is a reflection of the decisions that they've made and they need the blessing just to be able to make good decisions. They need blessings just sometimes to be able to have patience so they don't become too angry and then end up losing job after job after job because they can't hold their tongue, they're undisciplined, and they keep losing one opportunity after another after another. And sometimes they just need to be blessed with a peace that can come out of your mouth. You'd be surprised. But bless people, bless them, and it, it changes the nature of who they are. Here's the fifth thing that I would say, keep smiling. Just keep smiling. Just keep smiling. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. That's what the scripture says, verse 15. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Keep smiling. See, the scriptures noted, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. I would say this to you, always take note of people who refuse to clap when you're winning. Always take note of people who refuse to clap for you when you're winning. And take note of people who laugh at you when you are weeping. 
See, Scripture says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. I know what it is to deal with the death of a loved one. And you know, I have incredible faith in my heart. When I go to pray for the sick, I, I, I believe with every fiber of my being for God to raise that person up. There are some people that, you know, I prayed for, and then when they died, I was shocked. I was so convinced in my heart that the power of God had gone in and that their healing would be manifested on this side, on this side. I mean, so when I pray, I really believe it. I really genuinely, authentically believe it. I really believe it with all of my heart. So you have to, you have to go and, 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 and really want to rejoice with people that are rejoicing. And then when other people have been in, at, a, at a very grieving time, I don't just go in with just great faith and power at that time. I've gone in and wept with people. Because sometimes the moment doesn't call for an infusion of faith. It calls for a demonstration of compassion. It calls for sympathy to where you feel what they feel. You hurt because you see that they are hurting. I don't want people around me, if I'm hurting, to be laughing in my face. You rejoice with those that do rejoice, but weep with those that weep as I feel your loss. I mean, there can be times when I see the, the loss so devastating in the life of the survivors that it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. It just, it breaks your heart. And you can sometimes lose it when I have done the funerals and I've seen a, a little child, seven or eight years old, saying, when is daddy going to wake up? And it can break your heart because you realize this could be my child. That could have been my spouse, my son, my daughter. But keep smiling. You know why as a, as a kind treatment to people? Because you never know when you're dealing with people when it will be the last time that you will ever interact with them. When the actor Paul Walker went out on his last thing, his last words were, we'll be back in five minutes. And he never came back. He never came back. And I want you to see verses 17 through 21 here. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all things, uh, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I want you to take a look at this little video clip. Take a look. A 14-year-old boy shot and killed an innocent teenager to prove himself to his gang. At the trial, the victim's mother sat still and silent until the end when he was convicted of the killing. As he was being taken away in handcuffs, the mother of the boy who was shot stood up slowly, looked him in the eye, and said, I'm gonna kill you and sat back down and the boy was taken away. After being in prison for a year or so, the mother of the slain boy goes to visit him. Now that boy had been living on the streets before the killing and she was the only visitor he ever had. Not even the gang members came to visit him. Now he was kind of frightened before she came, but she said, no, I, I just want to talk to you. And for a time, they talked, and when she left, she gave him some money for cigarettes. And then she started step-by-step step visiting him more regularly, trying to understand the guy who killed her child. And she goes every few months. And when he's about to get out at the age of 18, she asks him, what are you going to do when you get out? He said, I've, I've got no idea. I've got no family. I, I don't know. She said, well, I, I've got a friend who owns a little factory, and maybe I can get you a job there. So she arranges it with the parole officer. And then she said, 
where are you going to stay? He said, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't, I don't have anybody. She said, well, I've got a spare room and you can stay with me. So he comes and stays with her. So after six months, she pulls him aside and she says, you know, I, I really got to talk to you. Come on in the living room and, and sit down. Let's talk. So she sits opposite to him and looks him in the eyes and says, do you remember in court the day you were convicted of murdering my son for no reason at all? And I said I was going to kill you. He said, yes, ma'am, I'll never forget that day. She looked back at him and said, well, I did. I did not want the boy who murdered my son to live on this earth anymore. I wanted him to die. And, and that's, that's how I set about changing you and, and bringing you things and giving you a job and letting you live here with me. And you're not that same person anymore. That old boy, he's gone. But I don't have anybody. And I want to know if you would stay here. I want to know if I could adopt you as my son. And he said, yes. And she became the mother of her son's killer. The mother that he never had. That's why you never repay evil for evil. God is the one who will do it, and his plan is always better than anything that we could ever imagine. It's a real ingredient of real, real love. And sometimes you discover that it is the fear that people have that makes them do ugly things. But that's why also perfect love casts out all fear. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.